Hello everyone, welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for the 13th of December. Welcome to all this Saturday. Our topic today is class flow with our special guest Stephen Anderson, whom Peggy will introduce here shortly. I'm one of the show hosts, Lori Moffat, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. Thanks so much to Tammy for doing closed captioning for us. And now Peggy will go ahead and introduce Stephen. Well, hello to all of you. We are always so excited to have Stephen Anderson on Classroom 2.0 Live. He's been here several times. He's an educator with wide-ranging experiences who always shares his passions and his advice from the heart. He tells it like it is and always gives us lots of practical advice and resources. So we're so excited that he's here today to share class flow with us. Stephen is, as many of you know, because I'm sure you're already following him, an educator, a speaker, a prolific blogger and tweeter, and he's a dad. He lives in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And currently, he was a former director of instructional technology at the Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools. But currently, he has this fabulous title. He's called Content and Relationship Evangelist at Promethean. So as a former director of IT and instructional technologist and classroom teacher, Stephen is a recognized expert in infusing technology into teaching and using social media for learning. He also hosts a regular monthly webinar on EdWeb. Many of you may have been part of our a webinar uh, a few weeks ago that told you all about EdWeb as a great place for professional development. Well, Stephen's community is called Re-Energize Today's Connected Classroom, and it's always inspiring and has lots of great advice and resources for you. So if you're not participating in those, you should join today. It's all free. And once you join, you'll be notified of the upcoming webinars with links to view the recordings of any that you may have missed. Stephen has presented at many educational technology conferences. He was a panelist at the 140 conference in LA and New York. And he was a featured speaker at the first ever 140 EDU conference. He's also responsible for helping to create EdChat, which I know is a Twitter chat that many of you follow. And it's always so valuable to see what people are sharing there. And he won several awards. I have to tell you about these because the EduBlog Awards are going on right now. And he was recognized as the Twitterer of the Year Award in 2012. He was named an ASED Emerging Leader. So there are tons of things that make Stephen very special and us very proud to have him sharing with us today. So I want to say welcome to Stephen and ask you the newbie question so maybe you can help us understand a little bit about how ClassFlow might be similar to a learning management system. Well, let me say first, Peggy, that was probably hands down the best introduction I have ever had um, in my many years of, of speaking in front of, of educators and folks around the country and around the world. That was fabulous. It's, it's hard to believe sometimes all the things that I've had the, the wonderful opportunity to be able to do and the, the things that I've, I've experienced uh, is, is truly humbling sometimes. And even this, this is when, when you asked me to, to do Classroom 2.0, I was, I was psyched, man. I love uh, and tell people about these, these Saturday sessions all the time because 
you know, as educators, we're always soaking up the knowledge, and, and what a, I can't think of a better way to spend a Saturday other than maybe lounging on the beach, but I could lounge on the beach and listen and watch Classroom 2.0 live. So if you combine those things together, uh, this vortex of awesomeness might appear above you, but um, so thank you. So, so yeah, so learning management system. So, so as a former director of instructional technology, one of the things that I had to do was, it was look at a bunch of of different types of ways in order to deliver content to the classroom. And that's essentially what a learning management system is. Many people, when, when the, the poll question was asked, you know, are you using a learning management system? Um, some people, a lot of people said Moodle, some people said um, Canvas, some people said Edmodo. Um, there was a, uh, one person who said they were already using Classflow, which is awesome. Um, but those are all essentially delivery systems for content. Now, they all do, or Google Classroom, that was another one. That's one that I'm really interested in. Those are all heavy duty, big deal LMSs. Their job is to house a whole lot of content and provide it a lot of different ways and organize a lot of different ways and then capture a lot of different types of data and responses and things like that. The learning management system is a big, big deal. At this point, what you're going to see with, with Classflow, I don't see Classflow right now as a learning management system. I think it could eventually be there, and, and eventually when there are enterprise versions in Classflow for schools, I think you will see it as a learning management system. But for you in your classroom right now, you can think of it kind of as a, as a mini LMS, but it, it really, it's, it's, it's something that's going to really, truly help you in your classroom. Now, I haven't, I, I am I'm the content relationship evangelist for Promethean. Um, I work I work primarily on thought leadership, so I'm basically an advisor to Promethean on how how we need to be thinking about about technology, about how we need to be thinking and 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 doing and and what our positioning needs to be around different topics in education. And so I have the the very fortunate opportunity to be able to go out and speak and present and talk to lots of different people, and that's what I do is find those people who are doing really great things and provide them a platform and, and a voice. Part of that too, though, is, is understanding and, and how class flow can affect learning in the classroom and how it can make the life of the, uh, the teacher easier. I've known about class flow for longer than I've been at Promethean. Um, I, I learned about Promethean before it was, um, before it was released and, and out into the general public and, and saw the, the impact that it could have on the lives of teachers. And so when I had the opportunity to go to Promethean, um, it made natural sense to me that, that I could be, uh, that I could talk about it. So let's, uh, let's look at some things that Classflow does. So before I'm going to, I'm going to take you out into the, the, the Classflow platform and we'll look at some things that Classflow can do, but just a, a broad overview. Um, if you, if you have heard of Classflow, go ahead and drop a yes into the chat. And if you haven't, go ahead and drop a no. Um, but what Classflow is, Classflow is a cloud-based uh, lesson planning and delivery system for your classroom. Now, the idea is, as a teacher, you know, you have many different resources that you're trying to bring in to, to, to teach students content. So you're, um, you know, you're creating documents, you're creating um, audio or video, or you're grabbing those from the web, or you, or you are pulling in resources from your, that your school has provided for you. And you're pulling those all in from different places, and then you're having to put them in different places. You're having to organize them in different ways. And what Classflow does is organizes them in one place for you to create a lesson, uh, a lesson in order to deliver to your students. The beauty is you can be anywhere in the world, and you can create and interact with a Classflow lesson. So just like how now, uh, you and I are in completely different places. I'm in my, my home office in North Carolina. You know, you are out in, you know, there's some amazing places out in the world. We can, uh, we, I can deliver a lesson to you, which we're all going to experience, but you can create that lesson from anywhere as well, and you can pull in lots of different types of resources, which we'll look at, uh, which we'll look at later. What makes, what makes Classflow truly innovative is the fact that it can connect with any student device. So whether or not your classroom is a one-to-one -one for iPads, or you use Chromebooks, or you use Surface tablets, or you're a BYOD, it doesn't matter what those devices are. Any type of device that a student is carrying, if your student's carrying an iPod, if your student is carrying, if you've got a kid with an iPod and then an iPad and then a kid with a you know a Windows 8 uh, a Windows 8 laptop, all of them can connect to the same the same lesson. 
they'll have the same experience with that lesson, and you can deliver a tremendous amount of personalized content straight down to that, per that, that student's device. But I think more importantly was the, the question that was asked about, uh, about clickers and about utilizing those, those in-the-moment assessments. You know, if, any, if, if anybody um, has read anything about formative assessment, I mean, I'm a huge believer in the power that formative assessment can have on learning. I've done a lot of webinars and I've done a lot of conversations around formative assessment because I think it, that is where the power of learning is. And, and it was interesting when, when asked, you know, a lot of you said, you know, do you have devices? What, 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 was, what was disappointing was somebody said, oh, I have, I, you know, we have devices but they're, they're gaining dust or we don't really use anything. And I think what I found in my work with teachers was, you know, all of my teachers, they had, they had active expressions. We used Promethean in our district. They had active expressions. Every teacher had them, but it was always a chore to use them. They, they didn't leave them out on the desk because they were afraid they were going to get, a kid was going to take them, or they, so they didn't want to pull them out, or they didn't remember, or they didn't think about how they could be used in the moment. So they shied away from using formative assessment. What Classflow does very, very elegantly, and we'll look at here in a second, is that instant feedback in the, in, in the, the moment of learning. That, that, you have, you have eight built-in tools that you can, in the moment, in, in the heat of learning, ask students of all different types of kinds of questions. So you've got your typical yes, no, true, false, um, A, B, C, D. You can do numerics. You can do, um, you can do um, you know, uh, types questions. But you can also do something new and innovative that, that I don't think anybody else is doing called a creative, which we'll look at, which you'll have the opportunity to do here in just a second. But, you can also embed questions on on um, on cards. You can you can really create an environment where you know in the moment how students are learning and and where they are in their learning, and then deliver individual content to them as well, broken down through groups. So again, Classflow works on any device. It doesn't matter what device you have. So odds are that as we are in this session right now, none of us have the, exactly the same device. We're all using the same devices. So I'm on my MacBook, and you might be on your Windows computer, or you might be joining us through a, through a mobile device, whatever. All of us will be able to connect with this lesson just as we were if we were in the classroom. And, and that's the key is that you know, there are lots of different types of technology initiatives out there and that you trying to find those tools where that when I, so in my district I was doing BYOD I was instituting a BYOD policy and the t first thing the teachers would ask were how am I going to ensure that students are 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 all in the same place that I am or how am I going to ensure that all the students are having the same learning experience and it's, 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 it's hard when you have, you know, 30, 30 students and 30 different devices. It's very hard to create that environment. Well, Classflow can do that for you. So you can create, um, again, you can create those lessons and then deliver them seamlessly to your students, and uh, they'll have the same experience no matter what device they're on. Now, what some people may be asking is, yeah, I have all this content that's great. Can I use it? And the answer is yes. If, you, if you're a Promethean user and you have Active Inspire lessons, guess what? They import in. You lose some functionality. So if you know anything about containers or restrictors, um, you lose those functionalities. But the overall functionality, some actions from the Action Browser you'll lose, you can bring those in. But it's not just Promethean. If, you, if you're a smart user, you can import your smart notebook lessons. So just because it says, you know, Classflow from Promethean, doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're um, it's like, you know, you can't use them, you know, you can't put Active Inspire on a smart board or a smart board lesson on Act. It doesn't matter. We, we want to provide that experience to anybody no matter the hardware that they have. So if you're a smart board user, you've got that ability to import smart notebook. And if you don't use either of those, if you're a PowerPoint person or you use PDFs or you use other documents, guess what? You can import those in. In fact, I'm a bit, I use Keynote for pretty much anything. Um, don't tell the folks at Promethean, but I use Keynote for designing a lot of my stuff, and and then I just I save it down and I put it right into uh, I put it right into Classflow. So the lesson that we we're going to look at today was designed in Keynote, and uh, and then I just drop it right into Classflow, and it works just as it did as it did, as it was in Keynote. So it's incredibly easy to use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hop over and I'm going to do an application share so I can show you Classflow. And I'm, we're actually just going to jump right into a lesson. I'll show you the building piece after we're done. 
but I want to show you from the student experience. So I want to show you, so you are my students, I am your, your, your teacher. Now this is not a sage on the stage situation, but I just want to have the opportunity for you to experience what it would be like as a student. So what we're going to do is I'm going to have you join my class flow lesson. Now, um, you are, the, the way that you're going to join is, and I think the easiest way for you to join is, um, if you open up a tab in your browser, if you open a tab in your browser and you go to classflow.com slash student, you go to classflow.com slash student, I'll walk you through what you want to see. If you would rather use a mobile device, so you can use, a, if, you, if you have an iPad or an Android tablet, you can, um, you can download the Classflow student app for free. Um, if you have an iPhone or, or something like that, you feel you'll have to use the browser. But um, I, the e honestly, the easiest thing to do is just, since you're already in the web, just open you up a, another tab in your browser and just go to classflow.com slash student. Now, I'll, let me show you what that looks like. So this is when you land on classflow.com slash student. So I can't see the chat anymore. So if, if, some, if there's an issue or something, just somebody just, um, just break in. Don't, don't hesitate to interrupt me. But, um, so if you go to classflow.com slash student, if it's your, if your first time going there, you'll be prompted to answer some questions. So they're pretty straightforward. This is exactly what a student would see. You'd say, yes, this is mine. I don't share it with others. And then you'll be prompted to enter your name. So I'm going to enter in Batman. And then you'll enter in a code. And that code that you'll need, hold on, I'll get it for you here in just a second. So that code that you can type in there is 222BS, 222BS. So 222BS, 222BS. That's the code that you need. So when you're on this site, when you're on uh, classflow.com slash student, you just type in 222BS, join, and you'll see a card that should say waiting for a teacher. Actually, I'll just send this card out there. What you should see is this card here. So we'll wait for a couple people. So you can see, oh, there's already 13 people. So, so now, so what, so... Just so you know, so this is what you see on my screen now on the, on the student side, so we'll know we're on student. What you see is what you would experience it as a student, and then what you see here under presenter is what you would see as a teacher. So I've got, I'll show you, I'll run through all the teacher things that you can do. So you've got the code there, so 222BS, and, uh, and you'll be able to participate. And I'll bounce through. So if you don't want to join the lesson, you don't have to. I'll show you from both sides what it looks like. So right now, um, you can see up in the corner, you see it says presenter, so that means I'm in as a teacher. And just to give you, I'll just lay out kind of what you see here. In the center, you see what, what I'm presenting. So this is called a card. So this is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the piece of content that I have on the card. On the right-hand side, I have what's called the carousel, and the carousel shows me what all the upcoming cards are. So you can see I can scroll through and I can see all my cards. I can collapse that by hitting the little three little dots. Then I have my toolbar, and so I can, I have a plus button which will add a new card. And then I've got some tools here, like I can go in and I can start uh, drawing. So if I wanted to annotate something or I wanted to write something, I can do that. I'm on my trackpad, so it's not very good. Uh, but you get the idea. So I can, I'm not bound by the, just the content that I put into my um, my lesson, I can add content on the fly. So if I go to Google Images, and you know, of course, I would um, consider copyright here. Since my lesson's on Samer, if I type it incorrectly, let's say Samer, I'm like, oh, this is a great image right here. I can copy. And, uh, and then I can load that in. I can also add in shapes. So there's a square. I can uh, see I've got all my different shapes. So I can do an abstract shape like this. So you get the point. I can also do text. Good morning. Insert text. And so on and so forth. 
so you can see that. See now on your screen what you see is um, the image that I've pushed to you. So that's one of the thing, that's one of the benefits there is I can push those images to you. So once I'm done, I can push that card out to your device and you can see what I did shows up on your device. Now I'm going to go on through my lesson. So here is a YouTube video. Now I'm not going to play this video, okay, but what I've done is I've gone through and I found as I was doing my lesson preparation, I found a YouTube video that I said, man, this really explains the Samer model really, really well. Here, if I press the send card button, that card then goes out over to your system. So now I'm seeing it as I was a student. So now as a student, I can play that video on my own, which I'm not going to do so it doesn't um, bust up the bandwidth. But at your, at your seat, so now instead of that content being in the front of the room, so now instead of everybody watching the, the video at the front of the room, now they have it at their seat on their device and they can go through it at their own pace. So I could say, hey, um, the video is two minutes long, so I want you to take three minutes, watch the video, and then, uh, and then I want you to talk to your neighbor about what you saw. Boom. Everybody watches the video. They have it at their own pace. They can scroll backwards. They can scroll forwards. They all have that ability. I have that video as each independently delivered to each device. So now I can say, okay, here, uh, here's an image that I found. So one of the things that I think is important is that built-in uh, that built-in assessment. So um, my cloud tool here has eight different types of assessments. So you can see I've got the typical one. So I've got a true/false. I have a multiple choice, I have a text-based answer, yeah, a numbered answer, scale, yes, no, and word seed. So let's say I want to ask you this question. I'm going to ask you a question on the fly. I'm going to say, your last lesson that you used technology, where were you on the Samer model? So maybe you use technology to substitute, maybe you use technology to augment, maybe you use it to modify something or redefine something. So I'm going to throw out that text-based answer. Now before you answer, this is what you see on your screen. So as a, as a student, I'm sitting here, I'm going to say, you know what, I just did um, substitution on my last, le my last lesson. Substitute. Okay, I just did substitution on my last lesson. And then I hit the green button, I can, say, I can say, you know what, I don't remember what those lessons are. I can click the card at the bottom and it will show me the card that I was on. So I can say, oh yeah, substitution, that's what I did. Now, if I want to change my answer, I can do that. So I'm going to put in augmentation, and I can do that. And I can hop over here now. As I, now again, I'm in as a teacher. You can see my blue bar is beginning to fill up, and I can see those responses coming in live. So you can go ahead, and you can you don't have to answer, but you can answer if you want to. Um, so you can see those those answers are coming in live and I can see who who did it uh, and I can see how long it took them to answer. So you can see, there you go, so you can see most people are doing augmentation which is great. I also have some different tools under here under the analysis. I can look at it as a graph so I can say wow, so if I, this is great so if you don't want to see names, so if you just, if you're just interested in getting a grasp for um, how people are doing, uh, you can, you can turn it on the graph, on the bar graph or you can do the, uh, the pie chart there and it'll show you a breakdown percentage. Now I can hover over and I can see who wrote who wrote what answer uh, and I can, uh, I can do that there. Now as we go through I can pause that so if I want to say whoa wait a minute you know let's talk about this question for a second. I can pause that, that poll and you see on the student side you can see that it's got a big pause button on it meaning that you can't answer. Um, cannot start for a while. Yes, I know. Uh, so it, uh, I can stop that poll, I can play that poll, uh, and then once I stop, then it's going to go back to waiting for a teacher. Now we can continue to go through. Uh, I've got some more images that I put in. Uh, now, and here's a question that I built in. So what do you think is a barrier preventing teachers from teaching above the line? So as we had gone through this lesson, you know, so the line here in the Samer model is um, is, is here between augmentation and modification. So if I'd said, you know, what is the barrier to prevent you from teaching, that te prevents you from teaching above the line? Now I could do this lots of different ways. I could, I've delivered the card to you, 
so I could say, okay, turn and talk to your neighbor about their, that last lesson that they taught. And you could have that conversation. But I think it would be more, I think it would be better if we started, a, if I started a poll and I said, give me one word that prevents you from teaching above the line. Give me one word that teach you, that, that prevents you from teaching above the line. And I can do a word seed question. Now what word seed does is, again, it looks like the text-based answer, so I can, I can say, you know what, one thing that, that prevents me from teaching above the line would be time. So time is a barrier for me, so I'm going to submit that. And again, remember I can click the, uh, the card so I can see the card. So here, so this is what a word seed looks like. So as soon as um, my screen loads here, that will show me what a word seed looks like. So I can see who I'm rating responses from, and eventually that will load. But what you would see is you would see the card in the center. The problem, it's probably my connection because I'm, saved, I'm sharing a, a whole bunch of stuff. But you would see all those words centered around, we, and we can come back to this so I can, uh, I, we can look at this in a second. I'm just going to let that run in the background. Um, but you would see the, the, the card in the center, and you'd see all the words flying in all the way around. And if, if you and I, if both you and I had said time, ours would group together and have a number on it. So then I would instantly be able to see as a teacher, okay, the, this, this response got had a very high response rate. Let's talk about it. Um, it must be my connection is the reason why it's not popping in there. So um, we'll, we'll try another one here in just a minute. We'll, we can come back to that. So I can continue on. I have typical whiteboard tools. I have forward. I have backwards. Uh, I can advance. Um, now you see here, you see some of my cards on my carousel. I have teacher cards and I have student cards. What that means is I can deliver I can have one piece of content on the screen and a different piece of content that gets delivered to your device. Now, I don't have that as an example here. Um, I don't have a, a different, uh, different content here. Let's see what kind of... So if this card and this card were different, you would see, I would see something on the screen and my, my card at my, my device would be different. Now why is that beneficial? So let's say I'm teaching a math lesson and I want my students to answer a math question. I can deliver the question to them on the student card, but on the teacher card, I can have an example for them to refer to. It allows me to differentiate that content very deeply because I can deliver something completely different to the student than I would, uh, than I can have on the, on the front of the board. Now clearly I can have, you know, if I go to this card here and I send that card, you're going to have the same thing that I have on my screen. But if this had been different, which I'll show you here in a second, um, you, uh, you can have different cards. Now you also see send card to group. Now what that means is you, we would have to have a group, you would have to have your students set up in your class. Um, and I'll, I'll, we'll look at how to set up a class in a second. But you can send different cards to different groups. So let's, let's say you have a group of students who are maybe struggling in multiplying fractions and you have another group who's doing really, really well in multiplying fractions. Well, I can, click, I can quickly, before I start my lesson, put those students into a virtual group in Classflow and then I can deliver them a, their own individualized piece of content while still delivering other content to other students. So I can really get down to the individual student level where, you know, I can deliver 20 different cards to 20 different students and provide them a truly individualized experience. That takes a lot of setup. That takes something that, that takes a lot of time to set up. And you have to have a class set up. Right now, you're just in as what I, what's called an ad hoc class, which means I'm just, it's just my, my generic class. You didn't, you were able to type in your name where if I'd said, if I'd set up a class, you would have to um, choose your name from a list. And then we could, I could send those to you as a group. But now, let's look at, um, I'm just going to throw in a blank card here. Now, so as we go through our lesson, one of the other ways that you can do, that you can use these assessment tools, you see, you know, these are typical. Word seed, yes, no, multiple choice, scale. Um, if I give you a scale, I could do agreement, confidence, generic, one to five. So I could ask you on, on a scale of one to five, 
on a scale of one to five, how are you feeling about what you're learning so far? One being, I don't feel very good about it at all. Five, I feel really great about it. So I can say, you know what, I'm a four, and I can submit that. So again, on the fly, I can see those responses fly in. So, you know, oh, I can see in my, in my class, most people are feeling really good about it. If somebody answers a one, so if, if, you, if you haven't answered yet, just answer a one so we can see. So um, I can say, wow, wow. So Lori, man, Lori's not feeling really good about what she's learning. I'm going to send a, I'm going to send a card to the rest of my class, but I'm going to take a minute. I'm going to stop and I'm going to talk to Lori individually and say, what are you struggling with? What can I help you with? And then we can have that interaction while the students go on and they can do their own thing. If, if they do a, another piece of content. If you don't know that in the moment, one, Lori may be the kind of student where she's not going to raise her hand and say, man, I don't feel great about what I'm learning today. She's the kind of kid who's going to say, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm just, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to, I'm just going to try and figure it out on my own. Where here, now I have the ability to ask those questions as we go through to keep the lesson moving. But I can take and I can pause and I can say, wow, Lori doesn't feel good. Um, and I don't mean to pick on Lori, but I, she doesn't feel good about that lesson. I need to pause and I need to say and have a conversation with her while the other students move on with their content so we can figure it out so she doesn't get left behind. That would be very difficult to do if you're not doing those formative assessment pieces. Now, you can also see um, we've got numbered. We have number responses. So here I would type in a number, and I can do um, – negatives, I can scroll up and I can do positives, I can write any kind of number in here, 4x plus 5, I can submit that, um, 45, submit, you can see it's for basic math, not really for anything um, too complicated. Now, when you're building your lessons, you have the equation editor, so you can create complex equations. Um, but in order for students to submit numerical answers, they have to be just numbers. Otherwise, you're just going to want to, you know, if you were trying to do what I was trying to do, you know, that, um, you know, 4x, 4x plus 5, you'd have to do a text-based answer. So um, numerical is strictly number. Now, one of my, my absolute favorite, favorite, favorite poll on here, my favorite assessment piece built in here is creative. Now, with creative, I'm going to look at it from the student side. With creative, you see your screen looks a little bit different. So on the, the right-hand side, you've got some new tools. You've got, you now have the ability to draw. You have the ability to do a square uh, or to do uh, shapes, uh, and you can change those colors. You can insert text. Uh, you can undo your whole card. You also have a camera. So I'm going to start my camera. And I'm going to say, hey, everybody, take a photo. And that photo goes right onto my card from my camera. And then I can say, uh, I can say, I'm so happy to be learning with you. Insert that text, drop it on the card. There we go. Grab that. Now, when I'm done, I can hit submit and I can submit that. Now, why would you ever use creative? You can use creative for a lot of different things. So let's say you're an elementary teacher and you want students to identify shapes. Well, I could say, okay, here's my card. Here's my shapes. I want you to draw a square. I want you to draw a square around all the squares you see on the picture. So as a student, I can come in and I can say, there's a square and, and there's a square, and so on and so forth. So I can go in, I can, put a, I can put squares over all the squares that I see. And when I'm done, I can hit Submit. So then once that plops in, you'll be able to see, um, you'll be able to see now, again, that's got, there's a lot of image on that. I'm already using a lot of, of, uh, of Internet, so that's going to take a few seconds for that to pop in. Um, but you can see you've got lots of different tools now. So now students aren't, don't, aren't bound by just the multiple choice. They're not bound by the true-false or the yes-no or the numeric. You can create situations where they have to go out and they have to take a picture. So it works great with a mobile device. So with an iPad or a phone or something like that, snap a picture, you give it, you give it access to the camera roll, and it drops right in. Um, 
it, it, you can see it works on a laptop. It just used my front-facing camera, and uh, eventually that will pop in, and we'll be able to see those. So I'm going to stop that. Um, to give you a better idea, I'm going to send. I'll send you a card with. Uh, here's a card with an image on it. So if I do a creative, see now when you. Mine it seems to be hung because uh, <laughs> because I sent that image. Uh, let me go back in here and do class close slash student, and I'm just going to pop back in myself, and it should drop me in. There we go. Now, so if I do a creative now, um, that should bring me back, and you would see this. You would see this image. So when you do a creative, it sends you an image of the card that you're on. Um, so it would send this card to the student device, which I don't know why mine is freaking out right now, but um, but you would be able to annotate over that. There are lots more things that you can do. I'll show you where you can go to see all the things you can do as a, as a student. It, since I've only got a few minutes left, I, it's more important for me to uh, to show you kind of the creative part of this. I'm going to stop that poll and leave. Now, this is the this is the the creation side of Classflow. So when you first first of all, let me tell you, Classflow is free. It's free to use. Um, if I were you, I would run out there today and go get you a free account because if you go out and get get a free account today, everything you have access to today um, will be free for you um, for as long as Classflow is around. Now there is Classflow for schools that's coming. There's Classflow for, for it's called Enterprise or Classflow for District. Where um, you know it's going to change, and those are those are features that that um, you know schools and districts will have to buy. As an individual teacher, you're going to want to have everything you have access to now. So I would run out, not right now, after our session's over, but sign up for a free a free account just so that you have the opportunity to explore with it. But I hope that you'll you'll see the benefit and you'll you'll use it. But uh, everything that I'm demoing for you, if you sign up today, you'll have access to. So. Um, so uh, don't forget to sign up for a free account over at Classflow.com. But um, anyway, so when you when you land on Classflow, you've got a couple tabs at the top. You've got classes, lessons, assessment, and resources. Classes is just that. That's where you create your classes. Now um, you can see I've got a couple classes set up in here. I've got um, a copy of my sample class. I have a an admin class and and whatnot. Um, those classes. Those are where I would put my students. So I see I've got here is my class of students, uh, and then this is how that's how you create groups. So you can add students to your your roster there, uh, and then if I go back, I can create a new grouping. So I can do add a new group. So I'm going to rename this group as Bluebirds, and these are the red birds, and then I just drag my students into those groups, put this student here, this student here, this student here, and so on and so forth. I can add a new group. Uh, I can have as many groups as I want, so, but again, adding groupings allows you to deliver individual content to students. You could, in theory, put one student in one group and name that group the name of the student in order to really individualize that experience. That takes a little bit of time, I know, but that way you could deliver different pieces of content to different students. Um, then once I do once I do lessons, you can see I can I've come in here and I've uh, I've delivered a lesson to this group of students. I can then resume that lesson. Um, I didn't give them any assessments, so I don't have any data to show them. But in here, in this class, I've got I did I've got some assessments here. I can go in and I can see, hey, what were what were some of the things that I delivered to them, and I can review how the um, how they how they did. Now this has got empty data in it, but I would be able to see what they answered on the questions had um, had I actually had them fill in the questions. So you can actually go back and you can see that data um, per class after you deliver that. That information, and then it's you saw it's it, you can export it out, exports out in an Excel CSV file, and so you can put it wherever you need to. Under lessons, this is where you'll go to create your lesson. This is where your lessons are stored. I'm going to come back to this because that's where I want to spend the most time. 
Assessments, the Assessments tab allows you to create assessments and attach them to lessons. So, you know, you have those eight individual assessments that you can give, the creative, the true, false, yes, no. This allows you to build assessments into, um, into cards and deliver them, kind of like a, you could give a quiz halfway through or something like that, a, different, a deeper type of formative assessment. Um, you, can, uh, you can attach uh, rubrics to these. You can attach um, reading passages. You can assign it all kinds of, of, of different types of, of um, uh, attributes like time. Um, allowing students to navigate and skip questions, showing feedback, so that feed, whole feedback for learning. So after you answer a question, it tells you if you're right or wrong, and it tells you the piece of feedback. Um, you can do that. You can have all that built in. If you're familiar with how questions are made in Active Inspire, you'll be familiar with this because it's pretty much the same. If you're not familiar, it's very, very easy um, to add those in there. Now, really quickly, under, uh, under lessons, this is where you go to create new lessons. So the big green button, that's create. So there I've got, I can create a new lesson. Here's my import a flip chart and import a smart notebook lesson. When you click one of these, it's going to tell you this is, um, this is the stuff, well, I guess I've canceled out. It's going to tell you this is the stuff that works and this is the stuff that doesn't. So you can um, take a look at those. You can take a look and see, okay, in this my lesson, I know this is, this is what's going to work. This isn't what's going to work. I've got all my lessons that I've created there. I've also got a community tab where I can go and I can see all of the, all the lessons that are shared in the community. So the ones that have the most likes up here at the top. So there's a class flow overview from our, our class flow evangelist, Emma. But you can see there's all types of different types of lessons in here. If I find a lesson that I like, I can click add to my lessons. And it's going to add it right over to my lesson so that when I go back, there's my let, there it is in there, and now I can edit it and I can make it my own. So any lesson that you have in the community, you can add to your lessons. And um, just like, you know, in the Smart Notebook community or, you know, in the in, in uh, Promethean Planet, how you can download lessons uh, and flip charts and notebook files that way, you can do the same thing here. Um, now let's, let's go in. I'm going to edit a lesson. So I'm going to go back to that Samer one, and I'm going to edit it really quickly. So you can see here's my, here's my set of teacher cards, here's my set of student cards, here are my tools at the top. So I can add shapes, I can add text, I can, um, I can add in links. So let me go to the bottom here. So if I add a card, I can add text, here are my, my font tools. Remember I said you had the equation editor? So if you're doing complex math, you've got your equation editor there you can do. You've got your superscript and subscript, so that is very helpful there. There's your shapes. Um, if you want to, uh, you can change the transparency level. You've got, um, you can change colors and change the shape and outline and fill colors. You got all that. One of my favorite things, you can add a link. So you can add live links. So my website, uh, I can just do blog.web20classroom.org. Add to the current card. There's my link. Oops. Helps my grab a pointer. And uh, that will appear on the screen. I'll show you what that's going to look like here in just a second. Once I get rid of that, delete. So you can add in links. You can also add in custom HTML. So if you have um, custom HTML that you want to add, um, you can add that you know, directly in into cards as well. So great for, for flash objects or timers or things like that. Those are really great to add. Now, Really quickly, down at the bottom, you've got um, other ways to add in content. So if I am going to go in and I'm going to add a card. If I'm, uh, if I've got my, my own set of resources here, um, which I'll look at it here in a second. My, I, every, every Classflow account comes in the class, with the Classflow resource pack. So you have lots of different already preloaded icons, images, um, you know, items that you can just, you know, add in, so I'm going to add that, so I'm going to add those binoculars in, then I can manipulate that, make those, you know, what I want. I can duplicate it, so I can make me another one. I can uh, order it, rotate it, I can anchor it, or I can do drag on clone if you're familiar with that. So uh, when I'm in my lesson, since I've got drag on, clone on drag turned on when I'm in my lesson and I was to drag this, um, it would make a copy similar to drag a copy. Um, but you can see, so I've got my resource pack there. Uh, let's see. Let me bring out that carousel there. 
Um, now, you can also see I've got Dropbox, Google Drive, and OneDrive. So Classload gives you the ability to connect to other sources. So I can hook over to my, uh, my Dropbox folder or I can hook into my Google Drive. And if I have Google Docs, those are, don't worry about those, don't say unsupported, they're, un, they're unsupported on my end because I, I have done something to my Google Drive, um, but don't worry about that. But you can, you see you've got, um, so here's a Google Doc, so there is, so there's a Google Doc, I can scroll through and find, um, you know, find one. So I'm going to add that to my, um, I hit the wrong button, add to current card. The beauty with um, with Google Docs is once they get added, it takes them a second to get added, but you can see there's that Google Doc. And um, of course an error with I probably got I've got to go in and do something to my Google Drive, but um, but you can see, but if you add a if you add a Google Doc, that Google Doc will uh, update live. So if you update it in Google Docs, it will update in your class little lesson live. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and if you use OneDrive, you can connect that as well. Now, web resources, this is where I think a class load really shines. So if I, I'm going to add a card, web resources. So let's say I'm looking for um, puppies. So you can see I can find images of puppies. So that one's pretty cute. So I'm going to add that one to the current card. Um, maybe I need a video. So, um, oh, here's a video of puppies playing. I'm going to add that to a new card. And you can see it automatically formats. It fills the card. You don't have to do anything else. Again, I haven't, I haven't done, and I've not gone anywhere different. I've stayed within Classflow. I don't have to, to go anywhere different. If you know of a, of a, of a, the, the title of a YouTube video you want to add, you can drop that in here. Otherwise, this, this does um, YouTube for schools, so it's a YouTube EDU. So it's only going to pull those EDU videos. Um, and it's only going to pull images from Bing that are Creative Commons licensed. So you don't have to worry about licensing with those. But then one of the coolest features is web pages. What web pages allows you to do is embed live web pages on there. So if I go to blog.web20classroom.org. And so there's my blog. I'm going to add that as a new card. Now, it embeds a live version of that, that web page on my on my, in my lesson. So when I go to play, just to show you really quickly, so here I am as a teacher. If I go to that card, this is a live version of my, of my blog. If you go in as a student, if I were to send you that card, oh, come on. Um, and if I had done, uh, if I had taken another step, like loading that safe script, um, that will be a, that will allow you to see there's the live version of the web page. So then I can scroll through that entire web page. So instead of having kids fumble with, um, with typing in addresses or things like that, you can embed live web pages right onto, right into your lesson and then send them out to your students, which I think is hugely beneficial. Now, um, there is about, I could spend probably another three or four hours talking about all the things that you could do in Classflow. Um, and there's so much more, and it goes by so quickly, and there's so much that you can do. I think it really takes you one going in and just saying, oh, what does this do? What does this do? That's how I learned. I, that's, that's how I, I figured out a lot of the things that, um, that I do with it. Um, but there are, there are some really great folks uh, in Classflow who can show you all of everything you need to know about Classflow. So um, over at classflow.com slash events, so classflow.com slash events, which I'll pop over in the chat here in just a second or if somebody wants to do that. You can watch these free recordings, getting to know Classflow, great lesson ideas from teachers on using Classflow, how to use the Classflow apps, how you make it easy with Classflow. All of these are recorded webinars that you can learn a whole lot more about Classflow and, uh, and see all the things that are, that are happening with it. You can also head over to the community tab and you can see, you can read what's new. The blog has lots of good information on it about how different people are using Classflow and, and those kinds of things and tips and tricks and whatnot. But definitely check out the um, classflow.com slash events and that, will, um, that will, will give you a lot of information about um, the, um, of all that you can do, because I surely can't show you all in, in about 45 minutes. 
so with that, I know there's probably a ton of questions, so I'll stop sharing and uh, and go back here. Um, really quickly, this is my information, so if you want to reach out um, at Web20 Classroom or you can uh, you can find a, a way to submit um, questions to me, blog.web20classroom.org. Um, that's the, those are the two easiest ways to get in touch with me. Um, I've got a couple books if you were ever interested in using technology more effectively, either as an educator or as an administrator, I've got a couple books. And uh, so yeah, so with that, I will see if there are any questions. Yes, there are, Stephen. I'm trying to get the latest one copied now. And then I'll start asking. All right. One question that came up towards the end is about fees. You did say it was free, uh, but uh -huh. a participant found the Apple app for teachers was $7.99 in the Apple Store. Yeah, that's the that's the iPad app, and what it, what the iPad app it is it, it is eight dollars. And I will tell you, if you have an extra eight dollar, if you really get hardcore using Classflow, which I hope you do, but the the iPad app allows you to. So there's a teacher remote which just allows you, which is free, which you can just basically thumb through your cards forward, backwards, um, add a new card, start a send a card. That's about all you can do. The teacher app gives you much more control. It basically gives you a live view of your class flow uh, of what you see. So it, what you saw is me as the teacher. It shows you that on your iPad and you can pull in different types of content. You can see the assessment data live. So you can leave the image up on your screen or on your board but see the data as you, as you deliver an mm -hmm. assessment to a student. As to students, you can see that live coming in or I had to click over to it. You can do that on your, on your, your device there. Um, and that then makes sense that it's eight dollars. Yes, yeah, so you can do a whole lot more with that teacher that teacher app for iPad. There is an Android version coming, um, mm -hmm. but right now it's only available for iPad. But there's yeah, it's a whole lot more that you can do. Control so it really allows for that true mobility around the right. Country. Sure. Okay, so that takes care of that cost question that came up. <laughs> um, Somebody asked the, about class flow advantages versus Edmodo. So what I what I think is I think that you know so the the, the what, one thing that I, I meant to say when we when we were talking about LMSs is I think you know Moodle that's a great LMS, Canvas great LMS, Edmodo great LMS. I think class flow can live within those. That Edmodo does a whole lot more with with student interactions of hey I can post a question and get students to respond. I can collect assignments. Same thing in Moodle, same thing in Canvas, same thing in Google Classroom. What I think, what I think separates, you know, Classflow is I see Classflow in a, for a different purpose for mm -hmm. actually creating and storing your lessons and then delivering them to your students. And that's something you can't do. You can't deliver and, and have that interactive content with any of those systems like that. Um, that that Classflow can live in all of those. I think it could live as a part of a Google Classroom or an Emoto Classroom or a Moodle Classroom. But it, it, where, it, where I think it shines is that interactivity between the teacher and the student of delivering content and being able to see that video right at my seat or see that picture right at my seat or, or, um, or I, can, uh, I can send my information. So, it, it, so with those creative questions, one thing I, did, I didn't show you was you could submit a creative, a creative response. I can pull all those up and I can see all the creative responses that my students did. I can add that card to my lesson, and now I can send that card back out to the students. So Johnny submits an answer, and I can submit, I can send Johnny's answer out to everybody. So now everybody has it. Mm -hmm. and that, I mean, that, that to me, there's that a lot of give and take and play in the classroom for that interactivity. I think is where it's uh, where it, it stands out. Sure. How does it compare to Nearpod? So they're, so they're, both of them are very similar. Nearpod, there's a there's a, a pretty hefty charge for it to do. Um, so you're with Nearpod, you're limited to the number of response of people you can have in a lesson. Um, I, I, you have no limit in Classflow. You have no storage limit in Classflow. Now again, if you, you're signing up now, your everything you saw that I have today, you'll have everything I'm talking about. You'll have um, that the, you know that that will change in the future. But if you mm -hmm. sign up today, you'll have it for free. But um, I was just did a session just the other day where I had a thousand people signed into my Classflow lesson. So you can't wow. do that. You can't do that with other 
with other with other products without paying a very large fee. With mm -hmm. ours, you know, what you have in the free version is what you have. Is there's there's absolutely no limit, no storage limit, no um, no join limit, no time limits, things like that. So that's why I, that's why I say, you know, even if you don't use it until next year, sign up for an account and and go in and and, and explore it and and be familiar with it, and and you'll have everything that I have um, today. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm asking questions and capturing questions. So <laughs> it, can students be in multiple groups? So students can't be in multiple groups, but you could. The way that you can get around that, you would have to create different classes. Um, th that is a feature that um, that people have asked for, being able to put students in more than one group. Um, that 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 has been a very sought after feature, and so mm -hmm. that I, I would be on the lookout for that one. Um, and what Kelly said about PD right there, uh, let me let me I'll, I think that's awesome. So I use I use Classbook for my PD. So when I go out, if you see me at a conference, um, you might see me in one of my sessions using Classflow. Now depending on Depending on the bandwidth at the conference um, is the is is dependent on that. But um, I use we use PD and the, before I left the district, um, we were using it for our PD. It's a really I mean it's truly it's engaging. It's very very engaging. It's a very easy way to deliver content that way. Now if you go into the community, I have a bunch of lessons for administrators on that just that of how do you deliver PD with Classflow. You can also look on the Classflow blog. And you can see I have a whole series for administrators. Um, and when I say administrator, I just mean district leader, not principal or something like that. But you can do, you can use it as a school leader or, or somebody who delivers PD. I have some some things that I that I have found specifically geared towards that audience. So um, it's some of the ways that you would do things would be different than you would do in a classroom. So if you're looking to deliver it for PD, you can go on the blog or you can go in the community and you can read and see those um, those lessons. Mm -hmm. And as far as the groups, could you delete old groups and then create a new one if you want to regroup students? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, you can go in and you can when you delete a group, it pops all the students out and then you can put them put them back in. Yeah. Oh, you okay. Do, yeah, you can move those students around how you need to. But all, but again, they can only appear in one group. But that has been a huge feature that people have asked for. So the the best way to get things like that done, um, no, there's no limit on creating classes. You can have as many classes as you want. Um, the best way to get things done is if you go to the, the Classflow community. So um, on the Classflow website, um, up at the up at the top, um, when you land on Classflow, um, where it says support next to the login button, if you go into the support community, there's a whole thread in there about feature requests, and they listen. A lot of the things that you saw today were were feature requests that people asked for, and if enough people are asking for them, that that says says to the developers, hey, we need to we need to take pause and. We need to kind of ask that. So go into the support community and request those features. Audio, that's one that has been asked a lot. Hey, can we embed audio? Um, that one has been asked a lot. I, I hear that one, you know, that one could be on the on the horizon. So they love to hear um, what people are asking for because it gives them a lot of great ideas of what to add next. Mm -hmm. If YouTube is blocked for students at school. Can they still be viewed in Classflow? So that's, a, that's an interesting question. I get asked that one, and it, it's dependent on the filter. What people have told me is that they have had success with with putting a YouTube video into a Classflow lesson and embedding it, and then sending that card with the video out to students, and mm -hmm. it working. And mm -hmm. some people have said that it doesn't. I I mm. can't say, oh yeah, it does, or yeah, it doesn't. Um, it, it, it's it, it's totally situation dependent. It's definitely worth a try. Yeah, it sounds um, like it, it's firewall dependent. It's, it's, I think it is firewall dependent. Yeah. But it's definitely worth a try um, in order to see if it works in that situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can since the Google Docs interaction with live time, students then can send responses to their Google Drives. Is that true? So the you would the way that it updates is you it actually updates through Google. So you would have to be out you would have to be out of Classflow and in Google, but you would be able to see those updates in real time. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure like what that that question would be. So if I the way so the way I'm envisioning that question is let's say I had a form, I could mm -hmm. fill out the form live through Classflow, and then I could see the responses in my Google Drive later. Yeah, you can do okay. that. So they're totally. 
because it's it, you just basically embed it as a form or a web page, and it, it's all completely live and, and interactive, just like how you saw my blog. I could click those links, and it would take me through my blog. Same thing on a Google form, where if you you can you can fill out that information on that form, and um, and it will will filter over to Google. Sure. Okay. Uh, how does it hold up with limited bandwidth? <laughs> um, it's a, I think it does. You know. At, as long as you're not sending, you know, video, mm -hmm. um, if you're not sending, you know, if you're sending cards and things like that with images, you're, you know, it might take a little bit longer. So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know what the lag was like when I sent a card, how long it took in everybody's situation, but it may be kind of that experience where, um, where we're streaming and we're doing that. But sending video, that's what really takes up the most. Sure. Um, and even sending the video doesn't take a whole lot. It's the actual playing of the video. Right. But you know, I've been again. I've been in those situations where I've had two, three, four, five hundred people on a lesson, and it flies. It does really well, mm -hmm. um, even on on some some conference networks. So, mm -hmm. uh, so like Roxanne says, remote teaching. It is completely possible. We I heard a story in Virginia this week about how a teacher um, was. She had the the student was was um, was in the hospital and was um, was on the cell. They had a cell phone. But they, but she was the the student had joined the class flow lesson, so they mm -hmm. they were using the audio from the cell phone, but that she was able to remotely, uh, she was re able to remotely um, be there through um, through the lesson. So, you know, it, it's it, again, it's one of those situation dependent. It doesn't, it's not going to eat up a whole lot of bandwidth. It's the actual the videos that's going to take a lot of bandwidth, or sending back really image heavy images from student devices could also mm -hmm. slow it down. But it, it seems to do pretty well in a, lot, in a lot of different types of situations. Sure. Will there be support for Unicode names? So that's a great question. I have no idea what that means. So <laughs> I don't know if Nanad is still in the room. I'm not familiar, I'm not familiar with what that means. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. I, no, I, just I might be typing doing some, now. I might be doing some googling or some learning later. Yeah. My name couldn't be typed in. Okay. Okay. So you oh, needed to use code I'll, to get it yeah, to get so, the okay. accents on the names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's a great question. So there will be localized versions. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Okay. I, to, I I completely understand. So there are localized versions. Um, yeah, so like if you're, you know, depending on the, the country that you're in, there, there were, I think there are 13 localized versions right now. Um, mm -hmm. And if you were to ask me to recite all 13, I probably couldn't. But I think the number, the last number I heard was, was 12 or 13. Um, but yeah, if, when you're in one of those localized versions, that's the whole, that's, that's why the localization takes so long is because there's a lot of, of that, um, a lot of, of that kind of programming detail that has to go in. Mm -hmm. And the last question I see is the one that just came in. How can this be used for flipped or blended classroom? So that's a great idea. So ideas? In, yeah, so in some of the, the versions that I know are coming, you'll be able to, st so one of the things that students will be able to do, now keep in mind this will be like for, um, for class load for schools or for enterprise, so, um, but the, in, those, in those further down the road versions, students will have their own logins. And mm -hmm. they'll be able to create, and they'll be able to to do. And you'll also have offline lessons where um, you know students will have the you'll, you'll be able to start a lesson, but students will be able to sign into at any time. So you don't have to physically be at the computer, but you'll in the in the cloud the lesson will be started, and the students will be able to go home and log in and log into that lesson and go through it like they were in the classroom. So those are all things that I see as possibilities and uh, and and things that are coming now. Um, in your in your basic teacher version, um, you know that that may not be that that may not some, be something that you see, but you could. I mean, I could see you. If, so if you if you were in the version we're in now, you could easily just you know leave your computer on and start a lesson, and um, either do it remotely or you know say hey for from 7:30 to 8:30 I'm going to do this, or um, you know you could do it that way. But I think that in those further versions that are coming, you'll see the more control given over to students. That's, the, uh, that's what we've been preaching for a long time, is allowing students to do more with this stuff. And so I think you'll see that coming down the road. So something you can't do right now is what someone just asked about um, 
more self-directed? Can students open a set of cards for self-guided lessons rather than that, direct that, instruction? Yeah, so right now, no. Okay. Um, right now, no, because the students have to have that code and, and they have to actually join a lesson that's currently running. Okay. But mm -hmm. that would be something that I would be on the lookout for in the first half of 2015. Mm -hmm. And do the people who logged in have to log out of the ClassFlow class, class student account? No. So what will happen is uh, when I end the lesson, um, we'll be disconnected. I, will, it'll, after, I think it's 10 or 15 minutes, it'll time you out. But mm -hmm. up at the top, you have a little gear um, up in the top of the class. Yep. Flow student, you have a little gear and it says exit, you can do it that way. Um, mm -hmm. And if you ever were to run into a situation where you, you know, a student was using the same computer and they were joined to another lesson, you can just hit that gear and just hit reset settings and um, it'll take them all the way, it, it'll reset everything in, on the class flow side and they can um, join new again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know I uh, turned off the the app on my mobile device here and then when I restarted the app, I was in the same place as where I left off. So that was yeah. great to, to yeah. not lose anything. Yep. Yep. Great features. Okay. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I think I exhausted the questions that I found. So we'll go ahead and finish up the session today. Oh, can it be recorded? Um, there isn't a recording feature. So if you have the ability to if you so if you're a Promethean user already, so if you if you, you could use screen recorder in your in the in Active Inspire or I think there's a recording feature in Smart Notebook as well. Um, you could use those um, and uh, and you could record them now, but there's not a native recording feature inside mm -hmm. Classflow right now, no. Okay. But that would be a great feature. That would be a great feature to request. Yeah, and there's other recorders. Um, that you could you could use another screen recorder, but yeah, that would that be a great feature. That's another feature that's been highly requested. Mm -hmm. Okay, terrific. Thanks so much for the information and the demonstration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. That was such a helpful demonstration. And I know people are going to be like me and are going to want to go back and re-watch the recording just so they can pause it as we go along and try out some of the things that you're talking about. So thanks very much for introducing this tool to everyone. And make sure you all get signed up now while all of these features are fully available to you for free. Just want to let everybody know that we're taking a little break on Classroom 2O Live, a winter break, and so we won't have any um, live shows between December 20th and January 3rd. But if you run out of time, and ha if you have time, we would encourage you to go back and watch some of the recordings from previous shows that you may have missed. It's a great time to get ca caught up in some of those. We'll be having our big sixth anniversary celebration on Saturday, January 10th. We hope you'll all come and join us. Well, it'll just be a really fun show and sort of a trip down memory lane for the past year. January 17th, we have a great show coming up on all of the new features in Symbaloo with someone actually from the Symbaloo team sharing with us. And then the next two weeks, um, we will not have shows so we can all participate in two fantastic virtual conferences. One is Educon Philly on January 24th. And the January 31st one is the Student Technology Conference. And I'm sharing this slide now because if you have students that you would like to get some screen time for and make some global connections, they can sign up to be presenters in this conference. The presentations only need to be about 20 minutes long. And it's a conference entirely run by students 
for students. There is no age limit. So be thinking about that. You have plenty of time to get signed up to present. The advantage of signing up early is you get your first choice on the time slot. But think about doing that. And the conference is January 31st, so you can sign up till almost like the week before the conference. So maybe when you come back to school, you could do that with your students. And that is another conference that's hosted by Steve Hargadon on the Learning Revolution. If you sign up for his newsletters, you'll get all of these great updates every single week. So with that, I'm going to turn this back to you, Lori, to take us out. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, you can nominate a featured teacher by filling out the form at CR20 Live Featured Teacher Nominate with the tinyurl.com ahead of that. Uh, each month, usually, Classroom 2.0 Live does have a featured teacher for the month. Uh, you can also nominate yourself if you'd like to do that. When you exit the show, your browser should open a link for the survey. And it is a, a Google survey. Uh, it should open itself, but sometimes it doesn't. You can take the survey link from the chat box. You can also find that link in the Live Binder for each month in the Classroom 2.0 Live Resources part of the Live Binder. When you take the survey, at the very bottom, you'll find two fields that will ask for information so you can get a, a professional development certificate. These are sent to email addresses, so please make sure instead of the school email address that you use a personal email address. A lot of schools will block you from receiving this email back. And in the recent months, something new to the certificates is that now they will, uh, you will get it with your name already typed on this line. If I get my pointer back, the line up here, uh, which is kind of neat. All of the recordings, both video and audio, are at iTunes U. So you can access these on um, mobile devices. You can also get archives through the RSS feed link here on the web page. So there are a lot of different ways to get the archives. Again, special thanks to our Special guest, Stephen Anderson, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our website, and to everyone who participated in the show today, thank you. I know there were a couple people in the show who were users of ClassFlow. I'm not sure if any of you would like to share on mic. I don't know if those of you that are still left, if you have time to do that, it would be much appreciated. If not, we will end the show here. Does anyone want to take the microphone? OK, again, everyone, thank you for coming. And in order for that recording to process, you do need to log out of the session. Thank you. <laughs>